家好，欢迎大家来到今天的呃“设计腕大师说”栏目。今天是我们的第二十二期“大师说”啊、呃。那么“大师说”栏目呢，是我们设计腕成立五周年之际推出的一档节目。呃，那么这个也是呃，我们作为这个呃，将国际上的这种最新的呃设计思想、最好的设计的呃思想去呈现给大家的一个呃福利项目。呃，那么呃，我们的这个“大师说”呢，其实迄今为止已经邀请。请到了非常多的这些呃重磅的大师来到我们的节目当中啊、呃，比如之前的呃结构主义大师 Peter a s e n m a n 彼得 a s e n m a n 啊、呃，还有我们的普利斯克奖得主呃包赞巴克，以及我们的建筑大师呃萨夫迪呃，还有我们的呃卡拉特拉瓦先生等等。呃，那么呃，我们我们说大师说节目呢，就是希望将这些国际上的最好的大师的顶尖的思想都呈现给大家，帮助大家一起更好的成长。呃，那么今天来到我们的大师说栏目的是两位大师，一位是雷姆库哈斯先生，他是呃欧玛的创始人，也是著名的建筑师，普利兹克奖得主。呃，那么另一位呢是大卫·塞莱特先生。他是欧玛的呃管理合伙人，也是全球业务策略的呃执掌人，另外也是著名的建筑师。呃，那么今今今天呢，就让我们跟随他们两位一起开始这个三个项目的从无到有，呃，从概念到落地，呃的这个全方位的一个讲解。呃，大家一会儿在听的过程中，如果有问题呢，也可以在我们的群里面提问。我们最后在 Q&A 环节会根据时间的情况来抽取一些最有代表性的问题来与大师互动。啊、呃，那么另外我们今天的直播是呃有中文和英文两个频道，大家可以在下方，在我们的 Zoom 的这个下方来选择中文英文的频道来听。啊、呃，那么另外同时呢，我们也在腾呃我们也在微信视频号的这个。平台同步的呃进行一个中文声道的直播。那么接下来呢，我们的大师说就要正式开始了。Okay, so today we are very honored to have uh Mr. Raim and Mr. David uh from OMA to join our master talk. Uh, and uh they will share with us uh their three projects uh with their um、uh, amazing like uh design thinking. Okay, so uh welcome Raim and David. Thank you.、Uh, thank you. Okay, I will、uh, start with a small introduction to OMA.、Uh, next one, Sylvia. So OMA is an architectural office,、uh, um, and we, with、uh, the architectural office, built, of course, many buildings、uh, around the world.、Um, but next to being an architectural office,、uh, we also have our mirror image,、uh, which is called AMO,、uh, which is a think tank、uh, with uh, which we get involved in all kinds of subjects. Uh, around the world,、uh, from energy、uh, transition to fashion, and with which we do also a lot of、uh, writing. Next one.、Um, OMA is a partnership of、uh, eight partners.、Um, uh, Rem and myself are presenting today.、Uh, we also both operate globally. And our other partners are in、uh, each part of the world where、uh, we have projects,、uh, so that we can be together with our clients on the table making the important decisions.、Um, we therefore also really operate together as a group uh, of uh, uh, people that think about design and other topics that are related、uh, to the world. Next. Uh, we have offices in Rotterdam.、Uh, both Rem and I are calling in from the Netherlands.、Uh, also, an office in New York, a design office in Hong Kong, and then uh, other uh, offices related to projects.、Uh, for example, also、uh, we worked in Beijing、uh, and Middle East and in Australia. Next, as I said, we have. Projects all around the world with、uh, all kinds of typologies. We don't only focus on、uh, one type of architecture,、uh, for example, cultural architecture or housing, but we、uh, work on all、uh, different typologies, especially in circumstances uh, where uh, the brief still needs clarification and where we、uh, can work with the clients on uh, complex uh, environments and situations. Next. 
Uh, we therefore like to be involved as early as possible so that we can uh, really help uh, uh, formulating the challenge and then also start working uh, on the definition and later uh, the design phases. We also want to follow through our work all the way to completion. In China, we uh, did several projects. Uh, uh, I will just show quickly three. Uh, so CCTV in Beijing, very well-known project. Uh, Rem obviously uh, worked on that the whole way and I uh, worked on it at the end stages of the project. Next one. Uh, the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, a project we have done together from the beginning uh, to the end. Next. Next. And then the uh, Tencent Beijing headquarters uh, at the edge of the city in the on the edge of the third ring road, which was completed about uh, two years uh, ago. Today, we will talk to you about three different projects. And the first one is TPAC, which is uh, our theater that we will open on the 7th of August in Taipei. And Rem will take you through in the beginning. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be part of this. Uh, we have really been very unhappy that we haven't been able to visit uh, China uh, for a very long time now. Uh, and uh, my only consolation has been that uh, I, through Zooms, I'm involved as a professor in uh, the Central China uh, School of Art. Uh, so I will kind of show you uh, the building we're opening in um, Taiwan. Uh, but uh, I will also kind of talk uh, in general about the, the theater in general, but also about our uh, theater projects uh, over quite a long time and, and basically maybe more importantly over our ambitions uh, with the theater. Because the theater is a very interesting topology. Uh, it has been around kind of probably for more than uh, 4,000 years. And, and essentially the way it is kind of organized uh, has been remained uh, surprisingly stable. You have a stage, uh, you have a kind of an area in front of the stage, you have a kind of seating uh, defining uh, whether open air or enclosed the auditorium. And then you have uh, the backstage. The, and, and, and basically this relationship uh, between the technical aspects of the theater, the performance aspect and the auditorium, the consumption uh, aspect where you actually nothing but look. Uh, has been around for a very long time. And, and this is the plan of the Paris uh, kind of opera. And you can basically see how, how stable, surprisingly stable this kind of form has been kind of in spite of uh, a lot of technical and social uh, developments. Uh, and, and for that reason, uh, it's both uh, very exciting to be part of that long tradition uh, but it's maybe also exciting to try to kind of reinvent that uh, tradition. What you see here in the Paris Opera, kind of for instance, is that there is a kind of incredible effort to maintain and integrate every kind of part of it kind of in a single whole. Uh, you see the auditorium, the public staircase, which is very important, um, treated almost as the same in the same way as the kind of backstage and the kind of office parts so that it looks like a single entity. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think there are kind of more and more technical uh, possibilities and maybe also uh, our world is changing and becoming kind of more demanding and kind of perhaps more rushed. And, and therefore in the 20th century, there is a number of um, uh, inventions uh, that are trying to kind of reinvent the theater the way it was. This is a plan for Radio City Music Hall, uh, which I can wrote about in uh, my book, The Lyrics New York. And what is interesting here is that it, there's one theater here with a backstage, another theater, but it's not limited to simply two theaters. Uh, there are kind of smaller theaters here and yet uh, another theater there. So it's a kind of total of five theaters. 
And uh, what uh, I thought, and when I, when I wrote about it, is it's kind of really a pity that kind of basically each of these five theaters is kind of independent, and that there is not a uh, kind of possibility to to uh, to be more than kind of simply these five independent uh, theaters. Here is a kind of intriguing kind of moment because the auditoriums are separate, but the stage area. Uh, is uh, kind of could be connected, uh, kind of rather than kind of separate. So this was the beginning uh, on my part of a kind of thinking how uh, what theaters could be. What you see here also is that this is the Radio City Music Hall that was ultimately the kind of result of that uh, kind of building. And what you see is that kind of uh, much more than, of course, in the 19th century, technology plays an enormous kind of role, not only the light condition, but also the air, condition, air conditioning system, which in the kind of 30s actually did not only offer oxygen to the uh, auditorium, but also uh, included laughing gas. Laughing gas makes you kind of more uh, able to um, accept exceptional things uh, it's almost like a drug and so basically for uh, for five years in new york you know the auditorium that contains 3000 people every performance was uh, in a way a performance which was stimulated by drugs um here you see the kind of new relationship between between the performers uh, and the kind of people who make the theater, but also the enormous technical apparatus that kind of supports their performance and enables it. And so uh, uh, after, uh, and then this is another important picture because what it shows is that uh, the theater makers themselves are not kind of really happy anymore in the kind of configuration of the classical theater. And that they're looking more and more for, for instance, former industrial spaces, which uh, are wider, bigger, and which also enable them to uh, have uh, more uh, uh, and different possibilities, possibilities that they define kind of rather than the architect. So basically, the kind of first theater where we kind of really tried to uh, invent something else was a theater in England, in Cardiff. Um, for an opera where I really wanted to experiment with a kind of separation between the spaces for the public and the spaces for the theater's makers. Theater is kind of really a highly professional uh, activity. It's not only the actors, but it's a kind of huge amount of technicians, uh, directors, uh, uh, an enormous amount of rehearsal. So uh, the logic of kind of integrating these two parts in a single whole is getting kind of less and less. And in that sense, uh, this was an experiment in uh, saying, OK, uh, the theater has partly a factory function uh, and we uh, accommodate it in a kind of building that actually acts like a factory and that is kind of highly technical. And then there is kind of one uh, elegant uh, kind of entity which is the kind of theater, the performance itself. So here you, the auditorium enters, this is the lobby, and then in the same movement, you have the auditorium. So this is a kind of public building and that faces then the technical building. That was a kind of first experiment. Um, what? Yes. There's a second experiment uh, where we um, uh, were uh, in Dallas, uh, in America, but we also were confronted with a kind of new situation. We needed to do a theater, but the theater had to be kind of very flexible because it also needed to accommodate uh, commercial uh, activities and commercial events. And kind of basically what we did here is we put every aspect of the theater, every technical aspect in the theater, every uh, uh, office aspect, every uh, set uh, creation, every rehearsal in a kind of single tower, and then kind of liberated the stage and the auditorium completely uh, as one open space. And then we used the technology that would uh, serve the theater also to uh, create uh, every time uh, a kind of different auditorium. So basically what we did, everything in the ground is stage 
And then the auditorium can be defined by the technology that is hidden in the tower. So here again, we became aware, but we were also kind of very insistent that actually the technology uh, that is necessary for the theater is in itself extremely kind of interesting and extremely beautiful and extremely ambitious. And that it is actually kind of strange that uh, all that technological ambition and technological kind of presence is always hidden in theaters and that all you see is a curtain that opens and then you see magic, but you never see how that magic is generated. So we became more and more aware of the, and developed the ambition to also kind of show that magic and give it its place. Here you see how the classical theater uh, uh, the, which you uh, see above a stage is uh, present above the entire auditorium and basically each of the seats can be kind of pulled as if, as if it is a kind of decor. And so in uh, uh, something like one hour, you can completely liberate this uh, kind of space and use it for any other uh, activity. Um, this is another kind of further development of uh, this idea that kind of, uh, it, which we are building currently in Manchester, where on the one hand, we needed to kind of respond to the desire of theater makers for one huge and differentiated uh, space, uh, almost again, like a factory or like uh, almost a hangar, but there was also a demand for a classical auditorium. So basically, we basically connected the two uh, in a kind of very straightforward way, so that here you can do anything as a theater making, but there's also an opening to an auditorium where you can arrange a kind of more classical kind of performance. And the scale is kind of really exciting. The scale of this uh, space would uh, accommodate an airplane. Here you see the, the factory and the auditorium. Now, um, uh, there is another kind of thing that kind of really fascinates us, and that is, of course, the growth and the uh, continuous importance of uh, technology. Uh, here you see in a region in America, kind of in Nevada, larger and larger kind of factories. Uh, this is a battery factory for Tesla that are extremely sophisticated uh, in the interior, uh, but where uh, as a spectator, or as a visitor, you don't see anything. And this kind of strange uh, uh, muteness or this strange uh, inability to be, uh, to show, show what is going on is what we kind of wanted to address uh, also in Tape. Because from the outside, you see, you see this. May I go back? Yeah, on the outside, you see this, and then kind of on the inside, you see this, and it's kind of really a pity that uh, all this uh, unique beauty and unique aesthetics are, uh, are, are inaccessible. So here, that is basically the kind of reason that we developed uh, Taipei. This is the theater in Beijing. We did not want to make uh, autonomous uh, theaters. We know theaters that have nothing to do with each other. But what we did is basically we integrated the technical uh, elements of three separate theaters into a single whole. So basically there is a kind of cube which contains this stage tower, but you see that you know we have experimented with this stage tower already for a long time. And from this cube are cantilevered the kind of auditoriums in three directions. So our ambition uh, was really uh, to, Im to uh, create classical theaters that could perform in the classical way, but also to enable uh, a lot of new possibilities that uh, are typically not kind of present in the classical theater. So here you see the, the diagram, uh, and then here the kind of configuration that we are also enabling, i.e., a classical theater, classical theater uh, three, but also in between an enormous zone that can be used uh, like a factory uh, with incredible liberties uh, kind of for the theater uh, maker. And so uh, I basically want to kind of end here. Uh, more and more, I think that what technology kind of implies is that uh, it requires its own uh, its own logic and its own 
priority. Uh, you know, but the vast majority of our energy in this uh, kind of theater uh, and, and of our imagination in this uh, theater has been invested in how it works, how the connections can be made, how you can both separate and connect how you can create a kind of uh, a, a new form of uh, theater curtain, which is again, not so classical. So that basically this kind of shift from the public to a more technological domain is what has uh, kind of interested us uh, the most or interested me, maybe I should talk uh, kind of personally. And, and therefore this kind of view of the theater is one of my favorites, uh, it's not about human beings, clearly, but it is about uh, arranging technology to support the wishes and the kind of fantasies of human beings. And, and that has been uh, a very interesting notion. So the human being is welcome, uh, we accommodate them, but they're not the main thing. So, uh, Another, and, and I end here and give the word to David, what is of course fascinating and has been particularly fascinating for us is to create this kind of building uh, in the most sensitive and kind of most popular and most populist and most alive, most vivid kind of part of the city so that it can become kind of part of it. So David. Okay, thank you Rem. Um, so I will take you through, so now you know kind of the road to the project and also the idea uh, of how it uh, came about uh, and we will now look at uh, how it uh, uh, turned out. So uh, next one. Uh, so we were asked to uh, build this theater on the Schilling night market, which is uh, <coughs> a very popular and very uh, a vivid part of town, uh, especially in the evening and at night, when also the theater operates to the maximum. Um, next one. The idea was to take the night market off the site and to create uh, only the building on site uh, and not have a public space there anymore. Uh, instead, we proposed uh, to uh, create a situation where we could keep the site publicly open and create the theater uh, on top um, so that the popular culture that was already uh, present on the site could uh, coexist uh, with uh, the new formal way of culture uh, through the theater. So as Rem said, we didn't want to create a situation where we had uh, the three theaters separated. Also to be able to go above a public space, uh, we had to make a compact building uh, that we could control uh, technically to the maximum. Next one. So uh, we were inspired by one of the hotpots that we saw uh, on uh, the night market, uh, uh, where uh, one dish is cooked, uh, three elements of one dish is cooked in one pan. We also try to uh, combine the three different theaters and to turn them actually uh, with their stages towards each other and then uh, put them in one cube of 54 uh, by 54 by 54 meters in which we have all uh, the um, stages, uh, the side stages, uh, all the technical spaces, uh, but also have uh, foyers and uh, public spaces and then hang the three uh, theaters where people sit uh, from that cube above that public space uh, of the night market. Next. So this was the render uh, that we made in the schematic design uh, stage. And what you see is also that that cube is made uh, very transparent so that you can see through the facade all the elements of the theater making, not only the front of house, like the entrance, uh, but also uh, kind of the rehearsal spaces uh, and the offices, uh, the cafes, so that people can really read what is happening inside of the building. Um, and here you see uh, the situation uh, with the night market uh, coming back towards the site and uh, mingling uh, in the public realm. Next. 
Um, most people arrive by public transport uh, and we were able to make a new connection uh, of public transport uh, to the uh, metro line uh, that is opposite uh, the building. And then you arrive, next one. Um, and then you arrive at this large public space, the plaza, uh, uh, in front of the building, uh, and you can approach the building um, while already seeing the three uh, main theater halls. Next. Uh, that uh, plaza is also underneath the cube, and this is uh, fully publicly accessible. And on the right hand side, you see uh, that the facade of the building uh, only starts uh, later. And that facade is also completely open uh, when the uh, theater operates. So you can walk in without a ticket and without a barrier. This plaza is uh, heavily activated. This was obviously at the Chinese New Year uh, for the New Year of the Tiger. Uh, and all kinds of uh, festivities happened on uh, this plaza. And also in daytime now or in nighttime now when the night market is happening, uh, people inhabit this space and uh, kind of eat there together, uh, talk there together and uh, um, do other type of activities that are organized. Next one. Then when you are through this facade, still without uh, potentially without a ticket, but also the people that go to the theater, you come up in this hall uh, where you can take the stairs up, and obviously there are also escalators and elevators uh, up to the formal lobby. And you see that here the aesthetics of the street and of the plaza are still the aesthetics of the theater itself. Next one. Uh, you move up, and here you see, by the way, a picture of our team in Taiwan that has been working on this project uh, all the time and also overseeing uh, uh, the uh, building of the building. Uh, we haven't seen them for the last two years as well because we couldn't enter uh, Taiwan, but they kept us up to date um, almost every uh, day about the progress. Next one. And then you end up uh, at uh, the foyer uh, level. And there you see that for the first time, uh, there is uh, some luxury that is normally uh, off the theater in this marble floor uh, that we combine still with the aesthetics of the street. So from here, people are distributed to the three different theater halls uh, to see their performances. The first theater hall is the Grand Theater. Uh, it's a very large scale uh, uh, theater box that uh, has uh, an end stage situation. Next one. And you move uh, to that uh, uh, theater uh, through a large set of uh, stairs and escalator that go all the way up and that both uh, uh, reach the normal auditorium, but also uh, the balcony seating. Next. And you see that this theater uh, uh, is a folded plane. Um, we folded the plane in such a way that the balcony and the auditorium are connected uh, through uh, a set of uh, uh, seats on the side uh, so that you can still walk from below all the way up. Uh, not only by the stairs, but also in the theater itself. It also created a situation that we can bring daylight into the theater from the back, uh, where we have windows uh, and the daylight can enter the auditorium. Of course, when there is a formal performance, uh, there's a curtain there to block the light. <coughs> it's a theater for 1200 seats, uh, and there is a main <coughs> stage, rear stage, two side stages, and also an understage. Uh, and we can rotate uh, uh, the site sets uh, uh, within uh, two minutes. Um, so this uh, hall is um, operating for drama theater, but also for uh, classical opera and also for Chinese opera. We can tune the full acoustics through the technique that uh, the technical uh, elements that Ram already showed um, in his uh, previous performance to all these performances. Next. Uh, this is a render from the competition stage where we also wanted to create a very large proscenium so that we have a very large opening uh, for uh, the uh, theater groups 
uh, to engage with their uh, public. Next. And here you see images of how it is uh, today. Uh, this is the auditorium view uh, towards the uh, a large scale auditorium at the bottom and then going up on the side towards the balcony <coughs> setting. In, in between is where this daylight uh, uh, can come in. Next. Here we see it from the uh, VIP box uh, uh, looking into the auditorium. And at the top, you see all these technical elements uh, that help us uh, uh, tune the acoustics of the hall uh, uh, to the different uh, types of performances. You also see that the director and light box is at the back at the top. Next. And here you see for the first time a uh, test performance, uh, just before a test performance happened, uh, people coming into the hall and uh, seeing uh, uh, the project. Next. Here we have the view towards the proscenium and you see that we have a really large scale opening uh, to which you can even look all the way to the backstage uh, and also can see part of the side stages if wanted by the theater groups. Next one. Uh, for the interiors of the theater and also for the curtains, we work together with uh, uh, Inside Outside uh, and they uh, designed very beautiful uh, art curtain uh, for the project uh, as a public art um, element of this project. And the curtain has uh, light openings uh, so that when it uh, go comes in and it goes out, you see shadows and light uh, behind the curtain. Next. And this is the first image of uh, uh, one of the uh, performances that happened uh, during the testing period. Uh, so now uh, when the theater opens, uh, everything is uh, up to standards. Next. The second one is the multiform theater. It's a flat four theater. Uh, it can host six to 800 people. And it is really a black box. Next one. Um, it has a double shell, uh, so at the edge we have a foyer and underneath, uh, and you see that there is a flat floor that can be configured in all kinds of ways. Next one. Uh, so we can have a typical arrangement for a theater uh, with an end stage uh, and have seating in front of it and on the balcony. Next one. But we can also have a situation where the stage is around uh, the people, for example, and people are looking uh, from above. So we can actually make uh, an enormous amount of different configurations because we have this full technical grid above the whole uh, hall. Next one. Here you see an image of this uh, foyer uh, from where you can move into the hall or up to the balcony. It has light from above, uh, uh, so that uh, the uh, aluminum facade of the theater is uh, completely uh, intact. But uh, on the top, we create uh, roof skylights. Um, as I said, it's a black box theater, uh, which can completely be reconfigured. And here you see an image of that technical grid above the flat floor stage that can uh, that we can uh, reconfigure in all these uh, ways. And here you see a picture of the uh, balcony. Um, so what we already see in the test performances is that uh, the theater groups use this project in many different ways. And uh, for that, we also designed to fold out uh, um, uh, theater seating uh, that can also uh, be positioned in different ways in the hall. Interesting, uh, by making this project very compact, uh, was that uh, the backstages uh, of the Grand Theater and the, uh, the backstage of the Multiform Theater are actually touching each other. And by taking out uh, the acoustical barrier there, which can go into the fly tower, uh, we can create an enormous large theater, which we call the super theater. It can have a stage of 100 meter in length and 40 meters in width. And people looking from the two uh, holes 
onto that stage, but also if you position people on the side stages, uh, an additional group of people uh, watching the performance that uh, happens over this very, very long stage. Next one. And here you see an image that Rem already showed uh, kind of how that could uh, be configured. And this gives all kinds of new possibilities to theater makers, for example, to make theater plays uh, with different elements of the day and the night at the same time, so that people can look at uh, different scenes at the same time. Next. And here you see the model uh, that we made uh, during the schematic design stage showing this uh, enormous theater uh, space. And that means that uh, a theater uh, that is uh, not made for the classical uh, theaters, but that is uh, often performed in factory spaces on the edges of the city, uh, can really be performed here in a more formal setting with all the techniques available uh, to service uh, uh, the theater groups. Next one. And here you see an image, uh, a fully clear uh, image of that uh, length uh, of the super theater uh, looking uh, back into the uh, ground theater from the corner of the multiform theater. Next. And here uh, from uh, the balcony of the multiform theater all the way uh, to uh, the grand theater. Uh, and that's of course a very large scale space uh, that can be inhabited. And here you also see that we also did a test performance in this uh, large space uh, where a theater group uh, from Taiwan uh, kind of really um, created a situation uh, on that whole uh, and performance on that whole uh, stage. Next one. The last theater is the Presumium Playhouse. That's the bowl shaped theater. It's uh, set up as a dance theater and a drama theater. You go up from the foyer with an escalator uh, all the way to the bottom of the bowl. Next one. And then you end up in this double shell around the theater space uh, from where you move to your seats. It has a understage and a backstage. It is a seven, an 800 seats uh, theater, um, of which are uh, 250 seats are in the boxes in the double shell and the rest is in the auditorium. Next one. So from the foyer, you go up. Next one. You go all the way up uh, to the underside of the bowl. Next. And then you end up underneath this bowl-shaped theater uh, in a uh, from down lit space. And then you move through these double shells to the auditorium or your box. Next one. And then when you enter the hall, uh, this is the view you have with the uh, auditorium at the bottom and the boxes, the 250 seats in the boxes uh, in this double shell. Next one. And here you see how these boxes are also kind of hovering over the auditorium. So in this space, everybody is sitting extremely closely to the stage. Next one. And this is then a view of that stage. We have here a round proscenium. It's the only theater in the world with a round proscenium uh, that gives all kinds of opportunities, especially for the dance performances, to create a scene uh, that is very specific. Also here, we work together with ducks and inside outside to create a very special theater curtain. And what you see is that this theater curtain is a membrane uh, that exists out of three different elements. And with these three elements, uh, by directing them left to right or up and down, we can create whatever opening we want uh, towards the stage, which gives opportunities to very small uh, openings and very intimate, almost private uh, theater shows to very large scale, uh, the whole uh, proscenium and seeing the whole uh, uh, theater with its also its backstage. Next one. And here we see uh, in the test performances uh, uh, a show, uh, the Midsummer Night's Dream uh, from Shakespeare being performed uh, in the hall. And you see what the effect of that round proscenium uh, can be. Next one. 
Uh, here we, in all the theater halls, we also designed the seats. Um, we did that together with Paterna Frau, uh, a seating company from Italy. Um, and we have designed seats for each theater uh, separately. And of course here, uh, the concept is related to also the ball shape uh, of the theater itself. Next one. Um, besides these uh, uh, theaters, we also have a public loop through the building that is connected to this public space uh, of the night market. And uh, you can move through all the different elements of the uh, building and see actually uh, parts of the performances behind glass, but also see what theater making actually requires because it's a lot of hard work. There are people that planning the programs, there are people that making the shows and also a lot of rehearsing going on because here in this theater, there are also three theater groups that actually house here and, and live here all time. So then you go in through a separate entrance uh, indicated in this uh, red or orange uh, uh, light and you go through uh, an escalator uh, through the uh, foyer and you go into the building. Uh, here you see how that goes and you see that the first stop is going through the technical grid of the multiform theater. Next one. And in that, you really get a view of all these techniques that Rams just described that needed, that is important for, for theater making. And you can see people working here when the show happens uh, below. Next. You can also look behind glass into the backstage of the Grand Theater uh, and see people getting ready for the plates. Uh, and also, again, the technicians uh, working while the performance is happening. Next. Then you end up in a nice restaurant, bar, cafe uh, on top of the multiform theater that also has a beautiful terrace. And from there on, you can move uh, further into the building. Next. Here is the terrace that is on top of the multiform uh, theater. And you also see the glass uh, roof uh, that is lighting the foyer of this multiform theater that you saw before. Next one. Then you move with the escalator through the offices and you can actually see people working. Next. Um, you move through the office space itself uh, where people are meeting and preparing the shows. Next. And then you end up at the level of the rehearsal spaces where from an uh, open air garden, you can look into several uh, rehearsal spaces. Next. And these rehearsal spaces all have daylight because they are mainly active during the day, uh, people uh, practicing their performances. Uh, and then obviously they can have uh, daylight and uh, of, for the well being, that is much better. Next. There's also a panorama platform where you can overlook Taipei City and where you can also see the Palace Hotel, a very important uh, uh, element in Taipei. And here you see it at night uh, when people can gather here and also there can be small outdoor performances or gatherings uh, uh, organized here. Next. Here you see the view to that uh, palace hotel. Next. And then you can move on the top of the proscenium playhouse uh, through the ball theater and actually behind glass, see the performance that is happening on stage through speakers, you will also hear it. So you can't disturb it, but you can follow it. And therefore you can have a very low threshold first experience with theater uh, to, uh, uh, to then hopefully uh, buy a ticket for a next performance. And then you go take an <coughs> elevator down back to the plaza again. Uh, to build this building uh, was quite uh, challenging. It first had to hover above the public space but also these large scale volumes needed to be cladded and we wanted to keep this cube as transparent as possible. And therefore we wanted to have as little structure, as sub, especially substructure as possible. For that, uh, we created a facade concept that has uh, this glass cube uh, showing everything related to theater making and these three aluminum cladded volumes that are completed closed uh, that symbolize uh, the three different theaters and all the different possibilities 
uh, that are within. Next. Um, the building is built on base isolators because it's a very earthquake heavy uh, uh, surroundings. So more or less this uh, project is built on uh, walls that are on under oil pressure. So when there's an earthquake, it starts moving, but after the earthquake, it comes back to its position. A very uh, interesting technique uh, for the project. Next. Uh, we also tested uh, the facade offsite uh, uh, in the factory of the facade builders, where we tested the large curved glass uh, that is uh, uh, standing on its own and has its own uh, uh, stable integrity. And then the large aluminum facades, uh, which are built by shipbuilders uh, because they were the best people to create these large uh, sheets of aluminum in different shapes. Here we see this glass, uh, five meter 40 high, uh, standing on shelves and carrying its own weight and carrying the weight of the facade uh, back to the main structure of the building. So they don't need any substructure. That also means that when you're standing inside behind the glass, you see this beautiful wavy pattern, but you also have a very clear view with any obstructing uh, uh, structure behind it. Next. The aluminum is purely uh, grinded, uh, so there's no after uh, uh, treatment uh, with chemicals. Uh, there were welds made and they were grinded off and then the whole surface of the building uh, was uh, grinded to give it its final finish. And here you see the sheets being be prepared in the factory. Um, they were pre-grinded uh, by hand in the factory. Next. For the bowl, uh, it's a, um, a steel structure uh, that has a concrete inside and then this aluminum shelf uh, with insulation. Next one. So here you see uh, the whole open steel structure before the cladding was added. Next one. And here you see the concrete uh, inner shell uh, and then uh, the outer shell of aluminum being applied uh, to it. Next. And then here you see the large uh, elements of uh, uh, aluminum that was created. And then with, of course, the pattern of the gutters uh, that are in between uh, to capture uh, the rainwater, but also to break uh, the surface uh, area. Next one. Um, at the back uh, of the building, which is not necessarily the back uh, from an urban perspective, but much more a logistical part of the building, we have the West Towers, as we call them. They are cladded in black aluminum. Next one. And this uh, uh, black aluminum has <laughs> several perforations uh, related to the activities that is happening behind them. So there are offices behind them that requires less privacy, but there are also the dressing rooms of the actors behind them that uh, require a lot of privacy and therefore <laughs> they have small scale openings. Next one. And here you see that pattern of these different elements. So you can actually read what type of rooms are behind them uh, from the outside. So the large openings uh, for less privacy and the smaller openings for more privacy. The fully closed spaces are technical spaces or logistical spaces. Uh, the building uh, attracted a lot of attention from the beginning. And we worked uh, very closely together with Chris Yao, our uh, uh, architect from uh, Taipei, um, that was uh, co-designing this project with us. And we also had a lot of contact with Meikano and Toyo Ito during the process that were also building theaters in Taiwan at the same time to learn from each other and to constantly have the conversation, for example, about procurement. Next one. And here you see an uh, image of a postcard that can now be bought on the night market uh, with our building already in it. Uh, which, of course, for us is a nice uh, gesture of acceptance. Here you see the, uh, the building at night uh, being lit up, and you also see that from the inside, 
uh, you can see all the activities uh, behind this glass facade. Next one. And here you see that even better. And you also see different types of light. So all the yellow light is public spaces. All the white light are working spaces. And all the colored light are uh, rehearsal or uh, green room spaces. Next one. And then I show you a small movie about uh, the project. moving up. Big logistical doors. The lobby. Green to the public lobby. That was the first project we wanted to present to you today, uh, the Taipei Performing Arts Center, opening on the 7th of August.
The second project uh, that I will show you is the Bula Bardip, uh, is a museum in Perth, uh, largest museum from the Southern Hemisphere. It's a, a natural history museum. Um, and we designed it together with Hassel uh, as our uh, local architect. It's a project where uh, relatively old buildings for Australian standards of about 150 years old come together uh, with a new building uh, in the heart of the city, creating a new cultural center uh, for the city. Uh, Bula Bardip is uh, Aborigine language for uh, many stories. And that's also uh, the idea of the museum that many stories about the history of the place, but also the history of nature and the future of nature are told uh, there. Perth is a city of about 6 million people in Western Australia. And Western Australia is a, a place where about 7 million people live and it is as big as uh, India. Uh, so it's a large, vast open landscape. Uh, where there are very uh, few people. Next one. Um, Perth is uh, uh, located along a large river uh, and the cultural center is uh, located very close to it, right in the heart of the city. Next. Um, the idea is that this uh, cultural place uh, would connect the city back uh, to nature, uh, both in the hinterland and uh, to the uh, to the water, and con reconnecting the city in more ways uh, than it currently does. So next, it's a place uh, where people can tell their story, uh, where the nature is uh, kind of uh, prominent but also where cultural exchange can happen in the sense of performances uh, indoor and outdoor, and especially where the Aboriginal from Australia uh, can share their uh, knowledge. Next one. Um, it has a large public space uh, shielded from rain and sun. Uh, the climate in Perth can be quite harsh, uh, which is called the city room. It has several narrative loops because it's a museum that is free of admission and it has five uh, different entrances so you can move through the building in different ways. And it uh, has uh, large shifted volumes uh, that resemble uh, a part of the landscape of Western Australia. Next. So what we did is we connected the four old buildings together uh, at the first level uh, and created uh, new buildings in between and above the old uh, that uh, reinforce uh, this uh, kind of coming together of these four buildings that never belonged together. In between is this large public space called the city room. Um, one of their major uh, exhibition pieces is a piece of stone with a gold vine uh, through it, which was uh, kind of brought into the museum collection in 1892 to start the museum, uh, uh, which is also uh, kind of showing these narrative uh, loops uh, and, and therefore the color gold is used in the architecture as well. Next. Uh, the exhibition spaces are in the existing buildings, uh, but also in the new, especially the large box that is hovering uh, above uh, the uh, project and creating uh, the roof for the city room. Next. Um, what is interesting about this project is that you always, when you look at the project, have a view where old and new come together. Um, which was a very important part of the concept. But what's also very important in nowadays architecture is to give existing buildings that are old or relatively new, a new purpose uh, together with new build. And about 50% of the portfolio of OMA is now existing of such projects. Next. Um, we have about uh, 20,000 square meters uh, of uh, a programmed space, um, which creates this uh, largest museum in the Southern Hemisphere. Next. Um, what you see is that we have this uh, relatively open ground level from all the directions of the city. You can actually, all four directions, you can enter this city room. 
And uh, there are mainly educational spaces and uh, service spaces like the cafe and the lobbies uh, on that level. And then when you move one level up, uh, you immediately get into the narrative loop of the exhibition spaces that are colored here in red. Next one. And then you slowly move up all the way to the top where you have the city gallery, where you have a view over the city towards the water. Next one. Here you see the project in its context. Uh, it's a relatively uh, low rise part of town. And you see the library uh, next to it and the modern art museum next to it. Next. Here you see it from the top where you see these uh, four of the city room. This one. To arrive in the cultural center, uh, entering through this uh, city room that uh, also has the main entrance to the building. Next one. And in normal uh, days, that uh, city room is empty and people gather there and sit there or classes get their first education uh, in, the, in the plaza outside. Next one. But it is also a space that is used for food festivals or performances. And here you see a performance of an Aborigine uh, music group uh, that is using the outdoor space and people uh, uh, can uh, interact with this uh, culture. Next. As I said, the heritage was a very important part of this project. Uh, the oldest building uh, still standing in Perth uh, was the uh, old prison or the coal uh, from 1856. Uh, uh, and then also the library. What is going on? Uh, he lost connection, so I messaged him. Uh, we could, if necessary, we could uh, can do our thing and give him time to. Uh, oh, oh. Yeah, let's wait, but. Uh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so it seems like uh, we uh, kind of lost the signal of uh, David. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so it seems like we we can maybe do your might. What, what did you want to say? Oh, I said, uh, are we? Are we uh, lost the uh, signal of David now? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe we can either do Q&A or we can do... Yeah, but if he's not there, I th what, what we could also do is that I show Springer in the meantime, since we are... Yeah, uh, I uh, I think we, we can do both way. Like we can uh, we can do the uh, Springer first, or actually we have some uh, questions for the uh, T pack as well. So uh, okay, but uh, okay, I'm I'm happy to answer them, but then David cannot uh, kind of uh, participate in the response. Oh sure. So uh, yeah, uh, maybe we can move to uh, uh, Springer uh, first. I think that makes more sense. Eh? Yeah, great. Yeah. No, no, you were in here. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, so, um, sorry for the interruption, there, but I will talk about Springer. Um, we have now shown two cultural kind of buildings, uh, and I'm showing um, a building for an uh, for a company for a publishing company in Germany in Berlin. 
um, as you can probably know or remember even, uh, Berlin used to be uh, divided in two parts. There was West Berlin and there was East Berlin. East Berlin was communistic and West Berlin was Western. And so kind of basically uh, when I was a student in uh, 1971, I went to Berlin because I was kind of really fascinated by this wall uh, as a kind of urban device or even as architecture. And basically when I was in Berlin, I discovered this kind of office building, uh, which was an office building by Springer that wanted to really proclaim the superiority of the West by building against the wall and cladding the kind of building in gold aluminum. So it was a very brutal contrast uh, between East and West. So um, here you see kind of basically that kind of building, they extended uh, with a low rise building uh, and uh, the wall at that point kind of still went here and then went diagonally away. And in and the wall, so the wall was kind of running here and this way, and the golden building was here. And so by a really incredible uh, coincidence, uh, kind of something like 40 years later, uh, or uh, actually 35 years later, we were asked as architects to kind of really uh, build a large building here for the same company. Uh, and this building was, uh, or is supposed to kind of attract the contemporary uh, internet uh, IT uh, startup uh, personalities that uh, are now uh, so important for publishing. So basically this was kind of old fashioned publishing papers and books. And here the company is kind of turning into uh, basically an internet company that has its own uh, the, its own uh, TV station and its own uh, media uh, company. So, so basically the new building needed to express the new identity of that company. So uh, I was kind of really surprised, but, but also in a way inspired by uh, this uh, condition and by being able to build on the uh, place where the wall used to be in two parts. So the building itself is kind of still uh, acting in two parts. And, and here you see the golden building, the kind of area of the wall and, and, and the scale of the new building. Basically uh, the entire internet, sorry, David, uh, I, I just kind of leapt into the thing. Yeah, Shall I? Yeah, I finished mine. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I was all the yeah. way there. I could hear you, but you couldn't hear me. No problem, go ahead. Okay, okay. So, uh, so basically, you know, uh, what we did, the, all the internet people are um, fascinated by Silicon Valley. So we created kind of basically a landscape almost of office terraces um, that form a valley. And then we took the same shape and inverted it and kind of put it uh, as a kind of horse, uh, as a kind of second uh, top part. So basically in the center of the building, there is this kind of almost a tunnel uh, with these terraces and the tunnel is kind of directed at the existing building to express uh, a connection. Here you see the interior in a model, uh, you know, in the initial phase. And you also see that we try to uh, slightly differentiate the different materials and the different kind of physical definitions of each of the halves. Here you're kind of standing uh, uh, in in a higher level, in mid level of the building. You look kind of through this uh, atrium at the old uh, building, and you see how these terraces are occupied by kind of different uh, groups of workers that, in the typical case, are working on, for instance, on week long projects or on. Uh, kind of short-term projects in the same way that startup companies uh, kind of work. Basically, what was uh, the reason for this uh, configuration is that the uh, Springer is starting many different kind of companies that are semi-independent. Uh, and that basically, uh, given the fact that a single company turns into kind of maybe 20 companies or 25 companies, 
it becomes <clears throat> very hard to follow for the individual members of the uh, company what the other parts are doing. And so in that sense, kind of by inventing these terraces, uh, we also made visible to the company itself all the activities that are now part of that uh, configuration. And that is also uh, certainly why we won, because um, that that um, was, uh, we, we really uh, understood what the company needed. The company uh, is a German company, so uh, a lot of the work is still kind of fairly conventional uh, and is taking place in relatively conventional spaces. But of course, uh, with any internet, there is also an insistence on kind of really informal uh, conditions and informal dressing code and informal aesthetics. So we needed to combine uh, these uh, two things in a single building and in the end, what we offer them is kind of 75% of the kind of company can be in classical kind of uh, office environment uh, and only 25, but uh, it, uh, a very important 25 can have these uh, kind of modern conditions. And what was for them very attractive that we didn't do either completely formal, or completely informal, but that we were able to organize the uh, combination and the kind of interaction between the combination. So that is the point of this uh, thing. These are the 25 kind of informal uh, conditions that actually really uh, largely define the atmosphere of the building. So then there's a kind of further situation. There's a kind of bridge uh, between the two halves. Uh, here you see the kind of atrium and the terraces, a bridge between the two halves where there is the editorial board of a newspaper, Welt, and also an area for the television making uh, of their TV company. So everything is integrated in, in a kind of single larger whole. Um, what I think is very important to understand uh, today that architecture is of course uh, kind of one thing uh, today. And we always look at the architecture, uh, but the architecture is simply offering uh, horizontal planes where different programs can take place. But then, of course, there's also kind of very important the kind of structure. And what we did in the entire building is that the, the structure is also kind of partly white, partly black to refer to these uh, kind of different uh, conditions. And of course, any kind of building uh, today is now to a very important extent defined by iconography, wayfinding, kind of basically titles uh, to <clears throat> basically uh, enable and organize the coexistence between so many different uh, kind of parts and make it readable. This is the founder of the company and he also needed to be kind of recognized. So there's a kind of very large mural where the founder is uh, kind of looking outside uh, kind of forever. So uh, all of these, what is happening? Why, why, uh, yeah. So all of these um, uh, things are basically about the interior. Uh, the exterior, um, I wanted to um, make an homage uh, to one architect I uh, admire maybe more than any other architect, Miss van der Rohe. And Mies van der Rohe in the beginning of the 20th century was able in charcoal to draw a kind of very kind of modern skyscrapers. And so what we did, we took the same charcoal pattern and kind of projected it on the dark glass uh, of our own uh, kind of building uh, as a kind of homage, uh, as a kind of homage but also uh, as a kind of a way to uh, kind of resist uh, solar glare and to kind of temper the, uh, the relationship with the outside. So the ground floor is kind of very public. There's kind of basically two axes that uh, kind of intersect, restaurants, kind of canteens, uh, kind of big uh, meeting halls. Uh, and, and basically here the company celebrates uh, the togetherness, uh, you could say, uh, and all the elements for being kind of improvised together, community uh, are organized there. The other important uh, element is a kind of roof garden, uh, which uh, covers the entire roof and, and which is 
particularly now that global warming kind of uh, changes the climates also of northern cities, uh, is one of the kind of really popular destinations for for the company a, as a whole, and uh, and used also uh, not only for uh, entertainment but also for working. So here you see this uh, the, the last the last rendering I'm showing the rendering of that um, uh, charcoal kind of pattern on the dark glass, and you see that the entire facade is lifted. Uh, so that there is a kind of permeability and accessibility between the kind of city and the kind of project. Uh, this is a kind of real photograph. So this is the old building and this is the new building. And you see basically the kind of relationship between these uh, two entities. And now I'm kind of showing you only you know, a series of photographs that, uh, that give you uh, kind of sense of the kind of realized uh, quality of the building. Can I put this in the, yes. on the side again? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of the building. So here you're basically looking uh, up from the bottom. You see the kind of roof light, uh, but you see also the kind of ceilings of the different uh, components. Here you see kind of working conditions, uh, kind of semi-conventional. You see the incredible presence of media. And this is a media company, but of course, kind of in every contemporary building, the TV screens kind of create this kind of bluish uh, condition uh, as a given. And uh, what I think is more and more um, uh, <clears throat> an issue that architects have to consider is that kind of part of the uh, aesthetic, but part of the uh, of the machinery that we have is kind of dedicated to the virtual world, uh, even though the office building kind of remains part of the actual world. And this kind of duality, uh, I think, is increasingly important and and also important for architects to to discover it and to uh, to to exploit it. So there's a lot of, as I kind of suggested, uh, special furniture that is kind of designed for uh, kind of informal kind of interaction. Uh, and, and here you begin to see the kind of relationship between the kind of intimate uh, uh, offices and the kind of concentrated work, but also the larger kind of presence of this uh, kind of void space that uh, is at the center of the building. Here again, kind of pictures of the uh, typical office condition, you see that you know there's a grayish condition, but there is also in the furniture some elements of coat, uh, of uh, color. There, there are actual plants. People are even allowed to have their own dogs, uh, and and so uh, the the um, uh, interior is kind of really a mixture of discipline, strong discipline, uh, but also uh, escape from discipline. So here we are kind of looking kind of at the atrium uh, and kind of basically uh, seeing the kind of office configurations and, and how on these terraces we kind of basically specialize or have a, a whole kind of range of different uh, interaction between the kind of workers. Uh, and here, you know, again, you see basically the variety of landscapes that we are kind of organizing on these uh, conditions. These are basically uh, spreads of a book that we developed for the uh, uh, kind of publisher and that we will be kind of published uh, kind of very soon. You see the ground floor and then the kind of terraces going uh, in either direction. Here we look from above on the ground floor and two of these terraces uh, and, and one more terrace and see the basically the, the window uh, to the outside world, which is kind of very three-dimensional. And we did that uh, for cost reasons because the three-dimensional kind of arrangement uh, enabled us to save on structure. So this is the kind of actual picture of the actual kind of reality uh, that we first showed as a kind of rendering. You're standing here on the bridge, uh, kind of basically you look uh, over these two halves and you see how the outside uh, kind of opens up to the kind of city of uh, Berlin and makes uh, the interior in itself uh, far from introverted, but kind of really very closely involved uh, with the city. 
the, the block is very deep from here to the other side. So that is why also we had to introduce light shafts and kind of basically the, this atrium. You see how under certain angles, you the discipline uh, kind of, of the building uh, kind of dominates. And if you turn, you see the kind of much more uh, kind of free uh, organization of the kind of work. Uh, we use a lot of curtains. Uh, um, David mentioned inside outside that has helped us in uh, Taipei uh, and these curtains create kind of, uh, again, temporary working conditions and are important for the alternation of the uh, different moods in the building. And, and I think moods are increasingly important to uh, enable uh, particularly young people to uh, not be kind of uh, uh, stuck in uh, rigid environments or permanent environments. I think there is this kind of need for constant uh, alternation and, and shifting attentions. And here you get a kind of sense of what I mean with this uh, curious condition of the contemporary uh, environment that you're both there and not there uh, because you're here because the, you're standing in a building, but you're not there because you're surrounded by all these uh, other conditions. Here again, the kind of the window kind of to the world uh, and here a kind of curtain that defines a temporary boardroom and that is kind of reflected in the underside uh, of the bridge. We use a lot of uh, reflective material again to create and to distribute the uh, daylight uh, all uh, and carefully kind of through every part of the building. Here, we're looking at the bridge. You can see that the bridge in itself is also an office condition. It's a newspaper, so it had to be kind of relatively isolated. And then here, the kind of roof that is also used. Here again, the kind of bridge. And, and here you see very clearly that the underside and the upper part of the building are actually symmetrical. Uh, and and that, that creates a, a kind of slightly surrealistic uh, kind of sense of upside uh, down. The columns are not painted yet. And, and therefore you see you know, how important color, even if it's black and white, uh, can be in terms of explaining the coherence of the building. Here, the kind of bridge kind of, uh, uh, reaching one side, and then on the bridge, uh, the television making, the television studio. And you also see how almost any kind of part of the building can be used for particular ceremonies. Here, kind of the German kind of president opens the building, the kind of seating. Uh, in that sense, it's a building that can be used in many, many different uh, reasons, different configurations, different moments, and different densities. Um, but what is uh, particularly interesting is that, of course, COVID uh, seemed to uh, some extent uh, undermine the reasons for any kind of big office building uh, at all. But because we had so many opportunities, so many kind of open spaces, uh, even during COVID and now immediately after COVID, it seems uh, an attractive, attractive environment because there is not a kind of noticeable kind of packing uh, or creating of density. Here you see the building into the mirrored in an exist, the existing Springer building. Uh, so it's a kind of a nice symbiosis. Here you see the roof. Uh, the roof is kind of really uh, wild. Uh, we, we were able to have a lot of earth, so we could really plant kind of things. You see how you know different environments are uh, created here, a bar, um, and and how uh, all of these kind of functions as a kind of very typical modern kind of office building, which is, um, is particularly defined to offer its uh, and to attract uh, its young collaborators uh, kind of unique uh, conditions. Here you see the golden building and the kind of golden building kind of reflected in the old building. That's it. Thank you, David. Uh, continue. Yeah. Sorry for the technical glitch earlier. I was still being able to hear you, but you lost me, I guess. Um, yeah, so we were back in Perth uh, uh, discussing the heritage buildings. So I just explained that. Uh, 
there were many uh, or four uh, older buildings, uh, a parliament building, a research facility, a library and a prison integrated in the project. Uh, Victorian architecture um, for Australia, very important. Uh, next one. Uh, so we had to deal with a very uh, high level uh, of control. Uh, we could not really change the buildings, uh, but we could interact with them. Uh, so for example, here um, we intersected through the building uh, at the base level um, in a way that we can also restore it uh, when they want to do that later uh, to come back into that city room. Next one. And you see that uh, we created, uh, while keeping the whole uh, architecture of the building the same, in the footings of the buildings, this new passageway. Next one. <clears throat> um, you can enter also the project uh, through there as a secondary entrance. Next. And here you see how that has been done uh, uh, purely through the footing of the building. Uh, so that it can be uh, restored afterwards. Next one. And here you see the cafe that is then in the ground level uh, of that existing building. Next. And then you are back into the city room. Next. Uh, we also had to deal with a very old uh, staircase uh, that was very prominent in between the research facility and the library. Uh, that we uh, uh, kept and that became part of the circulation of the museum. Next. And here you see an image how we uh, restored it, how we added new railings to it uh, to make it compliant with the current codes. And uh, we also kept the roof. And, but then at the back, uh, we added a full new facade, which brought in light into this space, uh, while this was in between two buildings and in a very dark area. And so you can circulate from one uh, space to another. Here, uh, many of the interviews about the project were also conducted. Next one. Um, then uh, the main space, the Hackett Hall, which was the old parliament building, is an important space uh, that we, uh, from the city light, uh, city room, uh, opened up uh, through a large window. Next one. Um, and you see that we opened up that space uh, there where light uh, was filtered and not direct, so that no direct sunlight could come in. Uh, and the facade was put in front of the existing building, so again, uh, we can reconstruct it if necessary. Next. And here you see that uh, from the city room, you can look into that existing building and the new connection uh, next to it. And then underneath the learning studios uh, where the education for the uh, school groups happens. Next one. And here you see uh, that that Hackett Hall is also an extension of the events in the city room. Next one. Uh, here you see that uh, uh, the school groups are going into the hall uh, where the education facilities are. Next. And then the lantern of the Hackett Hall, a very important element to get daylight in. Uh, we cut uh, the roof of the lantern, brought that up into the new ceiling. And so now from inside of the building of the new build, you can look down uh, into the uh, par old parliament building. Next one. Uh, again, we did it in a way so that we can reconstruct it if necessary. Next one. And here you see a view from inside of the Hackett Hall up uh, to that uh, disconnected uh, lantern, almost no difference. And here you see a review from inside the a new building uh, where you can look down uh, through the glass uh, into the existing and where the lantern is actually hanging above. Next one. At this spot, you also have the view to the city uh, in between the old building at the bottom and the new exhibition box on the top. Next one. Um, the envelope is uh, very clear. So we kept the, the rich uh, uh, architecture of the existing buildings. And the new buildings have these shifted forms uh, that are partly transparent and partly with an aluminum facade that directs the sunlight. Next one. 
so we have this veil uh, that is actually uh, uh, almost erased from uh, ornament, and we have uh, mainly glass uh, facades next. And here you see how that veil actually works on the top exhibition box. Um, it uh, uh, completely shields uh, its inside. And then there where all the transition spaces or circulation spaces are, we have uh, the glass, uh, partly with this gold inlay uh, to keep the sunlight uh, that is very fierce in Perth out. Here is the veil, next one. It has a pattern of perforation, so we can bring daylight into the exhibition spaces. Next. And here you see the detail. The angle of the veil is different related to the angle of the sunlight. Next. And here you see uh, that from the outside, it looks uh, very um, opaque. But then when you go to the inside, you see that it is actually very transparent and it filters the daylight into the spaces, including into the exhibition spaces. It also gives beautiful shadow patterns. And at night, you start seeing the windows behind it and actually the light, the artificial light from the outside coming, uh, or from the inside coming to the outside so that you start reading uh, where happens what. And you see the circulation space below and the exhibition spaces on the top. Next. A large part is the copper soffit uh, of the city room that reflects all the activity. And uh, copper is a, an, uh, a material that is found in Western Australia uh, on ground, uh, large quantities. Uh, and that uh, therefore we use this material to reflect its natural history. Here you see how the underside is created. Next. And here you see how it reflects what is happening below to the rest of the city. And it obviously shields everything from rain and sun. And in the evenings, it really takes the life uh, of the city uh, up to the box. Um, we have very uh, uh, heavy uh, uh, populated exhibition spaces. Um, we have the nodes that are the circulation spaces, and we have the uh, pure logistical spaces, all designed in a different uh, way. But what is uh, the same is that they all have the uh, plastered ceiling and the uh, uh, terrazzo tile uh, floors over the whole uh, project. Next. So you see in the renders uh, that we already always had this floor and ceiling the same. Next. Uh, and uh, that the elements uh, within uh, are differentiating. Next. And here you see also kind of in the how it turned out, where you always see the same ceiling and floor, but then the elements uh, are uh, separate. This is the entrance where you can get your uh, audio. Here you go to the big escalator up to the exhibition spaces. Next. And then you go up next to the mural, which is fully digital programmed. Next. And you can uh, see the first uh, exhibition uh, elements coming in. Next. And then you are in this uh, logistical circulation spaces. Next. And from there, you can move up further or you can move into the exhibition spaces. Next. And you come in these notes. This is the note of the uh, that I showed you before. And there you see the gold ribbon uh, stairs uh, connecting the different levels. Next. And here you see these uh, golden ribbons uh, that connect all the different levels in circular stairs. Also, the main stair in the front uh, connecting the big boxes. Next. First the render, next, and then the end result where the gold ribbon moves up on the front of the building, next. A lot of people use this space not only to circulate, but also to play and sit, next, next. And here you see the big exhibition spaces uh, next to it. 
for example, about the transforming landscapes. And then you see all the artifacts uh, that are in these big exhibition boxes. Uh, might you write uh, in that last picture? And then you move back in this calmness uh, of circulation. Next. Next. Uh, a lot of uh, artifacts are very special uh, for the region. For example, these mega sharks that are found there. Next. Uh, but also they found a lot of dino remains uh, that are in the uh, museum. Next. One thing I wanted to show you is the Hackett Hall. This is that uh, old uh, parliament building uh, that we integrated. Next. And in that, uh, they have hung a blue whale skeleton, one of three blue whale skeletons uh, uh, available in the world uh, that hang there. And underneath is a plane for the education, but also a plane where activities can happen. Uh, the whale is called, nicknamed Otto. Uh, so you can see Otto in its full length hanging above from the ceiling in the parliament building. And then activities can be uh, underneath it. Next one. Uh, we envision that for education. Next one. But also for banquets. Next one. And also for uh, local fashion shows, for example. Next one. And here you see uh, one of the banquets that has already happened. Uh, so it is really also used like that. And we believe that even when it's such a fragile piece of art, you could almost say, and that need to be protected, uh, you can still have activities related to it and not necessarily to have it completely hang behind glass and make it a dead object. Next. The landscape, very important for Aborigine people, the connection to the land. Uh, we worked with them, which was a very interesting experience. They dictated what they uh, uh, thought about the landscape. They wanted an earth connection. They wanted to be able to do fire ceremonies. They wanted to have a dance grounds uh, in the Yorling Circle, uh, which we all incorporated in the landscape with them. Next. You also see these different bands of earth, fire, water uh, coming over the site. Next one. And interestingly enough, they have uh, six seasons instead of four, uh, which we also highlighted through the plants uh, that are connected to these seasons for them. Next. Uh, and we also used materials to highlight uh, these different elements in discussion with them. Next. And here you see uh, these different bands of landscape uh, and the yearning circle, the fire circle, and also uh, the water waves uh, coming in. Next. Here you see that the old coral, uh, the prison is a very contested space. It's now an education space about how uh, colonization happened in uh, Australia, uh, and therefore it is cleansed, and it is also digitally programmed at night. Next. And here you see these different elements of fire in black, uh, earth in the earthy color, and then uh, water uh, on the reddish color. Next. Old grapevine that we were able to protect that was already on the site. Next. And then the different elements uh, designed by the elder of the Aborigine people. Next. Next. And here you see these axes to the city room. Next. And here you see the digital programming of the prison uh, at night. So there's a whole story told about the history of Western Australia, the history of the buildings, and also about the architecture in the end. That is it. Thank you very much. OK, so thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Rain, for your uh, sharing. Um, and you've just, uh, just shared about like three different types of uh, projects, like um, office building, cultural building, and public buildings. 
So uh, just like uh, our design wire, we report on um, different types of uh, top landmark projects uh, around the world with more than 300 uh, developers. Um, so, um, and also we, we really hope to see more of your uh, landmark projects in China in the future. Um, and also about your sharing, uh, we also have some uh, further questions for you. Um, so maybe we can start with the, um, the museum first. Um, so uh, we can see that um, the, the museum that uh, there's a city room, uh, it is a public space and also it's a space for um, events. Um, so uh, could you uh, ex explain more about like uh, what, uh, what scenario in your vision uh, and how did you achieve it with your design? Um, yeah, so the city room was not briefed by the client. They actually had briefed a building that was on the ground fully and that would kind of create a city block uh, that people could not uh, go into. Um, but by shifting uh, the large exhibition spaces to the top of the building, we could actually completely open up that city block and uh, create a space that was shielded from the sun, which is the mo most important thing in Perth, but also from rain when, the, when it is there um, for uh, kind of public activities. And they wanted a new cultural heart. So we worked also with the city to create this cultural program year round with all kinds of festivals, all kinds of activities <laughs> uh, that could be on the site uh, that would actually bring people in and uh, expose them to their rich culture that is actually extremely old. Uh, and so here we were not kind of asked to do it. We kind of uh, found it while doing the architecture. And we were also asked to then help program it, which for us is this interesting mix between architecture and curation uh, to bring something extra to the city uh, that uh, was not uh, envisioned or expected, um, which was also uh, very much appreciated. And because of that, we're now working also with them on the concert hall, for example, uh, to give that a next step and to create another uh, space that can connect uh, on a cultural level and that the program can be extended over the city. Okay, so um, thank you for your uh, explaining. And also we have some uh, questions for the Springer as well. Um, so uh, we can see that the Springer is really an uh, interesting project with the valley inside. Uh, and about the valley, actually, we have some um, questions. So we can see that uh, there is an a open plan uh, workplace uh, in the valley. Uh, so uh, how did you consider about the privacy needs and also the uh, acoustic uh, issue? Uh, I, I think that um, um, well, what is very important is to uh, talk, to work with uh, excellent collaborators. Um, and so in this case, we had uh, kind of wonderful collaborators for acoustics and for light conditions. And uh, we kind of basically worked, uh, of course, largely uh, in terms of scale. Um, because the valley is so wide uh, and because the ceiling is also kind of not kind of really pushing you down uh, and because of the largeness of the kind of volume, uh, acoustics are actually not a problem um, uh, because basically the, the sound disperses. There are many kind of hidden acoustic uh, and absorbing elements, but, but actually if you're in the building, it's uh, actually amazing that you can talk anywhere. You don't have to. F and you don't have the feeling that you have to be soft. You can talk anywhere, but you can op visibly or uh, acoustically notice that you don't bother other kind of people. Um, and I think in terms of the kind of privacy, uh, as I said, the building consists of, of a number of uh, kind of really private offices. Uh, you you also saw them. But uh, on the terraces, uh, there is uh, kind of particularly 
uh, organized when people have to collaborate and, and when they have to interact. And so their privacy is less of an issue. It is more, do they have the means to interact? Do they have the stimulation to interact? And do they uh, have the, the tools to interact? Yeah. And so uh, that is where, why the furniture and the kind of variety of the furniture actually became kind of one of the key uh, elements of the project. And, and this is all um, kind of really developed uh, for this particular case, but um, it is now also uh, by the company who developed it uh, kind of part of a kind of general uh, series that anyone can, uh, can buy. Okay, so you mentioned that I, I, I would like I, I would like to add uh, kind of maybe one uh, thing in in general, which is kind of true for the three buildings, um, and and David uh, kind of hinted at it, uh, which is that uh, we do for almost every client uh, uh, um, we make propositions that they didn't ask for. Uh, in other words. Um, we, but we take, at the same time, we take the program very seriously and very literally, uh, really to the square meters, but simply by arranging it kind of differently, for instance, not putting something on the ground floor, but lifting it, uh, or, you know, kind of splitting a building into parts uh, and, and yet uh, accommodate all the square meters, uh, we, we simply offer more than, than people uh, ask for. And, and that more is kind of typically in kind of response to, uh, to new conditions and to new demands and to new ways of living. And in that sense, I, I think that, uh, of course, if you have an office for such a long time with so many traditions, the, what, what is really key is to uh, find the kind of reasons and the stimulation to constantly renew ourselves also. And I think that renewal takes place by taking very seriously, for instance, the needs of young people, or for instance, the the, the culture that is developed by by millennials or by by other, um, and, and by being super alert, uh, how demand is constantly shifting because the shifting demands means that as an architect you can do things differently. Yeah. And uh, we can see that uh, the valley is uh, like a, a terraced uh, space. Um, mm -hmm. And also we are curious about the, uh, like the way funding, uh, because we can see the, uh, the functions, the spaces in the valley, they are intersected. Um, so how can the interior design language itself uh, can, uh, can make the space uh, easy to identify, like easily navigate? without um, the wayfinding system, like the signage or others, just interior uh, design uh, language itself. Well, it was uh, kind of really interesting in the sense that we, we had uh, a very extensive wayfinding kind of proposal, but uh, as they uh, kind of came closer to realization, uh, the company itself, uh, kind of said, okay, we actually don't need this, we don't need this, we don't need this, because the building itself explains itself. Uh, and and so, uh, and, and we also found uh, kind of quite simple code to, you know, uh, east, west, uh, and, and, and the kind of different floors. And we, it turned out that that was uh, in many cases enough to, to avoid, you know, kind of everywhere, those uh, indications of what is what. And, uh, and I also think that in many buildings, <clears throat> not only uh, kind of in Springer, we also kind of create a situation that there's a good overview so that people can orient themselves constantly. Uh, and we use uh, color also to indicate. So for example, in the uh, Taipei situation, we have three different colors of blue related to the three different theaters. And already on your journey towards them, that color becomes dominant. So you can simply follow a thread while you're maybe not even conscious of it. You follow that thread and then you, you end up where, where you need to be. Uh, and that can go from tickets uh, all the way to sit uh, to seat. So uh, uh, that is in many of our buildings. We try to avoid a lot of lettering. We try to avoid uh, a, a lot of signs, but uh, there are these key 
uh, colors. There are these key um, indicators uh, as symbols uh, that guide you, uh, but uh, more uh, unconsciously than kind of direct you constantly. Uh, but that, that is, of course, also the kind of really interesting thing about this moment that <clears throat> uh, with so many different kind of populations are using a kind of single entity that, you know, if you would really address them in their own language, you would get a kind of totally uh, chaotic English, Chinese, uh, 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 Malaysian, what, whatever. And, and so in that sense, uh, almost forced by the kind of richness of the current moment, we are forced to find new ways of uh, and new emblems and new symbols to guide people through a building. Yeah, we can see that um, like there's some colors in the space, um, but besides the color, uh, the space is overall still a very calm uh, space. Um, but sometimes people say that uh, the employee need to uh, need the colors, need the uh, like the warm color or the warm uh, feeling materials to feel welcoming, to feel uh, in, uh, inclusive. So how did you um, express the welcoming and uh, inclusive in the Springer projects to the employee? Because you know they uh, they will uh, work for such a long time uh, every day in this building. Well, I think that uh, kind of for instance the the welcoming is uh, taken care of in David's building in in one uh, gesture, which is to have this copper underside you know, and, and that puts literally everything into a kind of warm warm glow and that's a kind of typical so you don't have to be particularly welcoming there is already a kind of wel welcoming mood uh, kind of in Springer um, there is uh, really the welcoming is done by uh, actually offering a place where you, before you uh, kind of have to go to work you can have a coffee you can lounge uh, you, you during your work you can decide to work on the roof so it is uh, not done by um, uh, creating uh, let's say creating warm and, and very uh, uh, um, deliberate ways of uh, feeling welcoming you but it's done by the uh, range of facilities that uh, are actually accessible to you yeah, like the ultimate convenience uh, for the employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, we see that uh, there is open plan in the uh, valley and it really works. So uh, do you think is it even necessary to put a, a permanent uh, partition or permanent wall uh, in the space? Uh, if there's uh, like, do you? Uh, if there's a permanent wall you think is needed, uh, which location is it? Well, we, we developed a system of uh, walls that were not permanent, but if there is a need, you can kind of put a screen. Uh, and, and, and basically there again, we almost produce too much furniture because uh, it is much, uh, it's used a lot less than they originally anticipated. So that is for me a kind of sign that uh, a sign that kind of basically it's it's not necessary. W one other kind of really interesting phenomena is that um, the amount of uh, emails that uh, employees sent each other has kind of redu been reduced drastically. Uh, some people think it's been reduced by 50%. And what that means is that the building itself promotes communication and, and uh, in a way makes it less necessary to kind of send emails. So in that sense, uh, it also creates a slightly different culture, less remote and more direct. Ah, okay. And I think what we see in office buildings at the moment, uh, especially after COVID, is that they become uh, places to get together and to have exchange. Uh, and obviously when an office building is set up in a way that is completely uh, parceled up in rooms. It's very difficult to have that communication. And at the same time, you of course need spaces to uh, uh, retreat yourself, to make a phone call or to be uh, meeting people. Uh, so the good balance between uh, private spaces and open spaces and social spaces, especially 
is currently uh, really, really important in, in office buildings. Office buildings are not there only anymore to work extremely hard, but are especially there to meet each other, communicate and, and interact. Uh, and and that, that is a kind of a new way of looking at it again after the COVID situation. Yeah, exactly. Um, and speaking of the uh, support service of uh, the function area, uh, we have uh, we also have a question about that for the Springer. Uh, like, is there a, a planning principle for the uh, service, like the uh, supporting function area with the uh, normal working area? Is there a, a planning principles for them? Um, I, I, th I think, uh, uh, and, and that, that is why I try to uh, indicate that the building is both very disciplined, but also uh, includes a lot of uh, kind of freedoms. Yes, there is a kind of schematic kind of organization, but that schematic organization is also kind of modified and softened uh, in the kind of execution. And what I'm uh, really fascinated by uh, kind of right now, is that uh, almost any organization that uh, I'm working with or we are working with is trying to undo the um, the division uh, kind of between people who serve and people who are served. Uh, and I think that's a kind of actually a very good emancipation because you used to you know kind of come in an office and then you had the cleaners who kind of or you had the kind of IT people who are not somehow treated, be, being treated as part of the population of the building. And I think that everywhere there is a kind of push for emancipating those supposedly simple people or simple professions and to try to uh, kind of really create more equality in the, in the staff and for the staff. Uh, okay, uh, I see. Um, okay, so that's all about this bringer. And also we have last few questions about the TPAC. Um, so uh, for the uh, Taipei, uh, you mentioned about the hot pot as uh, your inspiration for the building. Um, and also we are, uh, we wondered if there's other like Taipei elements uh, to be applied in this uh, project? Uh, David, we yeah. Yeah, that's what, uh, so, so um, yes, we, we really made it a contextual uh, project on many elements. So we are try to combine things and make things extremely efficient which is uh, very much the case in the uh, Taipei uh, culture. Uh, people try to be very efficient, try to combine things and, and make things condensed. Um, so that is something we, we worked with. We also kind of brought up this roughness uh, that is in <laughs> the urban uh, cityscape into the architecture. It's not necessary in, in Taipei to beautify everything, but to highlight things uh, through beautification. And that's also what you see in the project. Uh, we choose very clearly where to uh, put which uh, material and how to kind of have it reflect the street or the population and where to bring in the luxury of the theater. Um, and then uh, most importantly, by not inhabiting the public space through the building, yeah. but keeping the public space, um, we created this very dense uh, uh, connection between the theater and, and the public space, the society, uh, which is also happening everywhere in the city. There is no uh, space untouched, no space unused, and kind of the, the, the buildings and the public space constantly interact, which is uh, also here in this project uh, the case. So we, we had many inspirations from uh, the Taipei urban environment from its culture that we used in a different way, of course, in our architecture. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, add two things. I think that um, one uh, aspect of architectural uh, design and architectural conceptions is that uh, in many cases, the most important thing you can do as an architect is to leave things open 
not to define it, uh, not to say this happens here, that happens there, that happens there, but to simply leave the question open so that improvisation can take place, so that change can take place, and so that you are not exhausting at any moment with your design all possibilities in one go. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, uh, yes, we were kind of very alert and inspired by the environment, but uh, in my kind of introduction, I also tried to show that we are, have been kind of interested for a long time in kind of really analyzing what happens uh, and, and what is needed in a theater and is maybe the technical part more important or at least equally important as the kind of part where the public goes. So you see that kind of basically in three or four projects, we are pursuing that, uh, that question and that kind of basically there are different answers to that question, but the question is always there, you know, what, where can we actually invent? And that is, of course, one of the crucial kind of parts of architecture. You know, if you invent, you are not an architect or not a good architect if you don't invent. Yeah, I think there needs to be an ambition to invent in a legitimate way. You know what needs to be invented, and and on the other side, to accommodate uh, what you can kind of simply uh, accept. Okay, um, and also um, speak of the uh, technical. Uh, we also have a, a question about it. Um, like you mentioned, um, the multi-form, um, the multi-form theater and the grand theater, they can combine to a uh, super theater. Um, so how did you achieve it? Because you know, uh, you mentioned about you removed some acoustic uh, partition to achieve it. So we just wondered how to achieve it uh, because uh, you know uh, think about the uh, fire code and think about the uh, structural issue. So um, how did you make it? Yeah, so in between the two holes, there are two separations, uh, which are acoustical separations, more or less walls uh, that can come down and go up into the flight tower. Uh, and when they are up, you obviously have a huge compartment with a lot of people. Um, and then uh, there are several fire curtains that are in the technical grid uh, ceilings that if there would be a fire, uh, they come down and uh, separate off uh, different parcels with their own exit plans. Uh, so uh, we have in a normal situations, the acoustical uh, things are down and then we have compartments for each theater. And when they are up to create the super theater, we have a backup uh, fire curtain system that could separate uh, uh, the space into several uh, um, uh, compartments that then can go out of the building themselves. This was fully simulated also. So we did that in our 3D BIM model. We fully simulated uh, these uh, kind of scenarios of how people could enter and leave uh, the building which was of course a complexity by lifting the building up. You had to bring all these people up. Yeah. I, I think that there's kind of on the whole, um, you know, too little uh, fantasy and imagination in architecture because uh, rules are there to, if you kind of really think about them and if you work with them and if you, then it turns out that a lot more is possible than people typically admit. Uh, and 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 even um, bureaucrats are also kind of interested to engage in dialogues. Uh, of course, they don't abandon their role, and and they can be very severe. But if you develop the argument uh, according to the rules and see what more is possible with the rules, then typically they're open uh, for it. And when I talk about uh, fantasy, I think that what what is in in a way key is that. If you're in a theater and you look at the traditional play, you're kind of used to seeing, okay, first uh, you're in a forest, then you're in a village, and then in the third uh, scene, you're in a palace. And all those changes are kind of made uh, by technology. And so therefore it's not a major step to imagine that that same technology can also in the kind of real world create different conditions. And I think that that was the, point of our use of these same technologies to actually open up the, the 
the the range not only to have a set but to have a set in real life so it's like uh so did you uh like uh think about this uh technical like uh this uh simulation stuff um during the whole design uh, process or or is there a certain phase of design no, that, that's a continuous process. Uh, that's a kind of you start thinking about it already, how to build the building when you uh, uh, start working on the concept. But then when you start working it out, you come across a lot of things that are, for example, not described in rules and regulations because they were never done before. And there you then you start a negotiation uh, with the uh, people that need to uh, license the building or uh, the fire brigade or uh, other people, acousticians, uh, because you invent new things that also gives the opportunity to create a dialogue and to uh, uh, describe new sets of uh, uh, rules uh, that apply to the building. In this case, also uh, yeah. very in important to uh, design with the city of how we would be able to procure this project how could we get the materials we needed but also how could we build it because there was no contractor that could build the whole building there were yeah. elements that the contractor could build so we had to rewrite the tender law in taiwan to uh, uh, to be able to uh, create uh, a new uh, way of tendering this building um, so these type of projects that are one of projects that are important for cities also help developing uh, the bureaucratic system and and the system of of procurement uh, which is something we continued until let's say one year ago uh, uh, there were still changes made but uh, it's, a, it's a kind of really incredibly uh, um, incredibly fascinating to kind of really uh, look at the amount of uh, creative energy that goes in the design and in the implementation. And particularly in this case, uh, the implementation, uh, without any doubt, uh, consumed a lot more of not only time, but also ingenuity, also intelligence, also communication, also uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and David was uh, kind of responsible for a lot of that. Yeah, And, and, and therefore, that Part of it is, of course, kind of something which seemingly is invisible, but uh, which needs to be kind of recognized. On the other hand, uh, I would have to say that, you know, if you look at the competition entry uh, of this project, uh, all those elements were there. They were there in embryonic form and the ideas were there as ideas. Uh, and kind of, for instance, if you look at the competition entry of CCTV, you would also be kind of totally surprised you know, to what extent every single element that is key to its uh, kind of existence, including the structure, is basically there. Uh, but then, um, so there is a, a kind of moment where, and that is the beauty of competitions, there is a moment that you can, are free to speculate. You know, and, and if you speculate with intelligence, you anticipate solutions that you don't know yet, and then kind of an enormous period of implementation uh, uh, challenges also your own energy, you know, do you have the energy to make it work? Yeah, we can see how the, uh, like, how the design uh, improves the society uh, and how the technology improves uh, and helps the design. Um, so um, thank you so much uh, today for your sharing about those uh, fabulous projects with us. And we really uh, have a very inspirational um, talk. So um, our Design Wire is a, a media focused uh, and education uh, driven platform. And we link the, uh, like the best resource and best uh, designers and developers uh, all over the world together. Um, so, uh, and we also hosted uh, thousands of uh, events uh, with more than um, thousands of uh, people. Um, so uh, we really hope that when international travel is available, uh, we could see you in the China. We'd love to, uh, we, we are desperate to get back to China. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are also really wanting <laughs> to- We will be there as soon as we can. Yeah.
Okay, so thank you so much, Rim and David, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a Bye. great day.